Hello everyone, my name is Adam Zabrowski and together with Alex Matrosov we would like to give you a talk about glitching CRISPR bit chips empty back corruption for hardening ISA. However, this is the end goal what we uh, end up doing and before we end up doing that we also needed to go through various different um, research areas we would like to cover in this uh, topic today. Uh, to sentence about ourselves, uh, we don't want to focus too much here. Both of us did this research during our work at NVIDIA and here you can find some private contact information to me and Alex. And we just want to mention that uh, we did some re security research for a couple of years already. So what is this talk about exactly? Uh, so let's speak first about execution environment. So to be able to speak about execution environment, we need to have some kind of hardware. And when we speak about the hardware, we especially also mean about the CPU architecture. There might be various different CPU architecture like RISC-V, like x86, like ARM, etc. And when we write a software, software especially targets the CPU architecture. So any software which you write in the end are kind of designed for run on specific CPU architecture architecture hardware. Even if you write in the high-level language, in the end is still the interpreter runs on and targeting specific uh, CPU architecture. And in this uh, kind of scenario, if you would like to break such kind of execution environment, we can focus on the various type of the attack. We can focus on the pure software attacks or pure hardware attacks. Example of the pure software attack could be any kind of the memory safely, like overflow, use after free, etc. Injection, which is very popular in the high-level languages, like command injection, SQL injection, injection, cross-site scripting, or logical issues, where you're essentially trying to target a specific uh, software which is very badly designed and uh, which might have security implication. And there is also much more other attacks. About the pure hardware attacks, we usually think about the glitching type of the attacks, or any kind of the site channel attack, or physical probing of the hardware, also there is many more. So from the high-level perspective, if you think about the pure software attack, they are targeting specific implementation. Example could be specific programming language which allows you to have some kind of undefined behavior which you try to hunt or you can also target specific compiler specific software like firmware etc and there is no different than pure hardware attacks in the pure hardware attacks you also focus on targeting specific implementation example could be specific cpu family or specific implementation of the architecture isa etc and there is also Recently, a very nice research about what about mixing these two types of the attack, pure hardware and pure software. An example of such kind of mix attack could be, for example, meltdown or spectre attacks. They essentially mix hardware and software. However, if you think about that a bit more, what about if we found the bug in the reference code of the hardware ISA itself, not in the implementation of the ISA, but like in the kind of ISA itself, like a reference code for the ISA. This is pretty interesting um, uh, implication from that, because then the problem will affect all of the implementation of the silicon, not just a specific implementation or specific family, because everything which is relies on the reference code like ISA will be affected. And this is also interesting because in such case, software cannot trust hardware at all what they do. So this is exactly what we'll try to speak about today, this type of the problem which we discovered during our research. So uh, at first, how did we find it and how did we even focus on such kind of problem? So. Essentially, we wanted to analyze a specific boot software, like Bootrom, where specific microcode runs. However, the problem is that it was running on the specific RISC-V chip, which we essentially had zero experience with the architecture of RISC-V. And moreover, it was not just a simple RISC-V chip implementing base uh, ISA, however, they carry custom extension and custom functionalities uh, on this specific uh, environment which we want to analyze. And even more, the boot software was written in the Ada Core Spark language, Spark language, which we additionally also had zero experience with at that time during the research. And we're starting to focus on that a bit more quickly. Is there any kind of public offensive research uh, uh, publication about that language? Even did anyone even hear about that language before? Because we did not. And at that time, we also needed to be able to analyze the binary, especially the binary uh, compiled from Spark language targeting this custom RISC-V chip. And uh, there was no even uh, any tools who natively supported even simple RISC-V, including IDA Pro and Gitra. This was around 2019, and none of these tools natively supported RISC-V. 
And this is exactly what we try to speak about today. So during this talk, we'll try to describe our journey through all of the problems which we met uh, during this uh, research, which resulted in the end in the discovering ambiguity of the RISC-V specification and also one additional uh, problem. However, first thing first, let's speak about RISC-V in a nutshell. So RISC-V is essentially an open standard instruction set architecture known as ISA based on the RISC uh, principles. And unlike any other model most uh, of the ISAs, uh, RISC-V essentially is uh, provided open under open source that do not require any uh, fee. It's open source and free essentially. And uh, But there is some kind of side effect of that because it's open source and it's free. Essentially the same RISC-V chip might have tons of the different implementation. Even ISA is the same. So you think you have exactly the same chip, but implementation could be completely different and variant. And also RISC-V has a small standard based ISA we essentially have multiple standard extension. Uh, however, this gives you a potential huge fragmentation of the silicon because one base ISA with the custom extension, another base ISA with a different extension, and all of them still are risk -V. And everybody can easily add their own extension, which is very cool because it's open source, so nothing stops you to do that. So you just take the ISA, add your own extension, and build on silicon, which essentially, as a side effect, gives you even much bigger fragmentation because it's not only risk -V based with the different extensions extension but also they could be custom extension on the top of that and uh, what is worth to mention that um, today there is more than 500 plus members of the RISC-V foundation who support this initial initiative of RISC-V including a big players like Nvidia or Google uh, so most people now are familiar with the x86 and this is just prepared as very short and uh, simple table who compares this to architecture. So main difference is exactly license because x86 uh, charge you the fee for ISA and architecture while RISC-V is free. So there is no fee for ISA neither for microarchitecture. RISC-V is an instruction set based on risk uh, obviously and uh, x86 originally was a CISC but it's not really true anymore because since Pentium Pro x86 instructions essentially are turned into something called micro ops, which is kind of like RISC nowadays. And x86 is very old architecture, so essentially the, we have various variants of uh, ISA. They have 16, 32, and 64 bits of, of ISA. However, RISC-V is much more modern, so we have 32, 64, and there is even 128 bits of uh, variants of ISA, which is not locked yet, but essentially there is one. And uh, RISC-V operates on the memory model called load store architecture, where x86 is a register memory architecture and RISC-V has 32 general purpose register uh, registers but there is one special register it's called zero register which always keeps zero and what is interesting from security perspective um, uh, RISC-V natively support execute only memory known as ZOM you can set up this as this is supported in the page table entries however x86 normally doesn't support ZOM unless you have hypervisor extension then you can define ZOM like attributes in the slot table which is second level other translation and another Another big difference is software ecosystem which supports specific architecture. So x86 essentially runs everywhere. It's very old and very well designed and very well researched architecture. So you have Linux ecosystem, Windows, Macintosh and many more. While RISC-V from the practicality perspective you essentially have only one ecosystem which is Linux essentially. But again, from the security perspective, we would like to focus more on the privilege mode and levels which architecture carries. So this is a very nice picture taken from the blog post linked here on the below of the slides, which essentially gives you the... <coughs> traditional rings which x86 carries so originally x86 only had four rings which is ring 0 1 2 and 3 while ring 1 and 2 was not really used uh, however uh, when the virtualization hardware in virtualization of architecture x86 not not fully designed yet people trying to implement para virtualization of x86 using ring 1 but it's not uh, doesn't need to be done anymore because uh, now we have full hardware virtualization of x86 so traditionally in the ring 3 there is a least privilege code running which is like user application and in the ring 0 you have kernel code most of the time however over the time people demand more privilege levels so that's why we have something which we unofficially called ring minus one where the hypervisor works uh, software. Uh, in the ring minus two, there is some, something which we call SMM, which is more privileged than uh, ring minus one. And there is also something what not many people know, uh, management engine on the x86, which you can call this as kind of ring minus three because it's the most privileged mode. If you compare that to the RISC-V, uh, we have only three mode, uh, which is M, S and U. So traditionally, 
uh, uh, it's an open source architecture, so you have also various combination of this mode. So you can have M mode without any other modes, so you can have M and U mode without S mode, or M, S and U mode, which all of the mode essentially. So what are these modes? So U mode stands from user mode, it's kind of equivalent to the ring free on the x86, this is where the application runs, user application runs, least privilege mode. In the supervisor mode, which is S mode, essentially this is where what is equivalent to ring zero, this is where the kernel runs. And M mode is kind of interesting because M mode called, is called machine mode. What the ISA defines this is the software which is the closest to the hardware runs, kind of like a firmware. However, if you want to compare this mode to the x86, it should be something around the ring minus two and ring minus three. This is what you should think about as an M mode. It's the most privileged mode essentially, it's the most powerful mode. However, RISC V also works on the hypervisor extension, so we have a few extra modes. So uh, S mode became HS mode, this is where the hypervisor extended supervisor works. And we have two new modes, which is VS mode and VU mode, which is virtual supervisor and virtual user. This is where the VM will run, but also it doesn't cancel U mode, normal U mode, so you have also all of these modes together. And again, because it's open source, you have one additional combination of supported uh, uh, RISV chips, which, which is also M, VS and VU mode. And again, you don't need to implement all of the modes, it, you can choose which mode you support your hardware. And we as an attacker, we are very interested and we would like to focus on that mode, which is M mode, which you can kind of call it God mode, because this is the most privileged and most powerful mode runs, so if you are there, it's the most ideal situation. So how to be there? So essentially, we know more or less what is uh, risk v we learn about risk v a bit very quickly but we at least know what we are talking about and then we knew that the software which was targeting this specific hardware risk v which custom risk v essentially was written in spark and then we started to think about like what the hell is spark we never heard about that language like did anyone even hear this language before so what is like the core spark the core spark is essentially a programming language together with a set of analyzing tools so uh, Spark, in fact, is a type of like ADA language, ADA language, but it's a subset of ADA language. It's much more restricted and doesn't have full ADA features. Uh, because Spark essentially the, wants to be formally verified language and the formal verification is being carried by the exactly set of analyzing tools and this is where the strength of the language is, it's exactly analyzing tools. And this tool is, these tools include GNAT proof, GNAT stack, GNAT test and GNAT emulator. Essentially what this tool gives you as uh, attributes for the Spark language itself, it can statically prove various different things. It can prove that these dynamic checks can not, never fail for example or they also can warranty you there is absence of runtime errors essentially everything is in the known and correct states because of that you don't have errors or runtime errors at least and also uh, all of that it's formally verified which is very interesting and cool because that gives you a formal verified proofs that all of these attributes are, are being intact so what you should think about that from the attacker's perspective it's essentially a memory safe language it's a memory safe language which is formally proved so it's a kind of like a rust rust is not formally proved but it's a memory safe language and um, it's much stronger typing system than rust uh, because it has very strong typing system and because it's much stronger than rust they also there is lack of problems like arithmetic overflows integer overflows underflows etc which is very interesting and because of that it's a very secure language it's traditionally have been it was used traditionally in the industries which are critical like avionics railways or defense system um, so we should think about any language uh, from the developers perspective that you would like to model a correct states of the machine uh, of the software and the hardware and language allows you to do it uh, more easy or uh, more hard to do that like in the C language there is a lot of undefined behaviors so modeling all of the machine states it's very difficult and that's why you have various undefined states. Uh, other language is slightly more ac um, accurate in that case and allows you to give you more accurate modeling of the, um, of the states and uh, that's why there is less unambiguously and uh, less unknown states there. However, because Spark is uh, much more strict than ADA essentially, it's the most closest way how you can get to the correct states. However, because it's, uh, the strength is in the analyzing tools, uh, essentially this is what the 
tools can give you as an attribute. However, there is some kind of valves in the Spark language. Imagine you want to call the libraries which is implemented in the different language, like in the C. Essentially, Spark Analyzer will not be able to prove that the code written in C, which you call from Spark, is also correct in unknown states. So that's why there is a valve from that. And how does it look in the practice? So if you write a program and you make a mistake, the prover will not only tell you where the bug is, in the which line, in which file, but also that gives you proof of concept, essentially. So what are the values necessary to generate the bug or error? At this example on the top, you can see that Prover tells you that there is a problem divided by zero, which may fail, when the variable b has value 42. So it not only gives you the problem, and also not only tells you the problem, but also gives you the necessary condition how to execute the problem, which is very interesting. Another example could be medium array uh, index check might fail uh, when the my index have value 36 so it's very interesting and then we starting to think about that a bit more and so we wanted to analyze like what are the problems which specific um, tools can catch or cannot catch and we found one of the interesting scenario where I was able still to generate a program which prover says this doesn't have any problems which is you see on the top on this slide uh, mark on the green the prover said there is no problems there however when we run that we were able to execute stack exhaustion vulnerability and um, generate the exception because of lack of the memory. However, as we said before, the Spark is supposed to give you warranty there is absence of errors, phantom errors. So how is it even possible? And then we started to run other tools like GNAT stack and we realized that even GNAT proved it didn't find that bug, that problem, GNAT stack did. And on the bottom, on the red, you can see that they said that the GNAT stack analyzed all of the different cases and analyzed there could be a um, problem with the uh, stack exhaustion. So what did we learn from that kind of um, approach? Essentially, we learned that you can compile still a buggy code but the problems are detected by the tools and the developers might not run them at all. So it's very interesting uh, attribute because it depends on the um, developing scenarios and the process of developing the software on the company. And also tools are orthogonal to themselves because they detect completely different classes of the problem and to be fully protected you must run all of the provided tools. And again it depends on what the process of software development is uh, to be able to find out if all of these tools are run. And uh, another problem is, is there is no clear definition what are the classes of the problems which can or cannot be detected. It's very limited and pu for public information what can be detected what is not. And again we didn't find anything from the security researchers perspective so what did we do? We end up trying to do more research and find out because if nobody did it before us we must do it by ourselves. So this is what we end up doing. We're starting to evaluate, it's kind of strong word, but let's say analyzing the ADA core Spark language from the offensive security perspective. And we divided uh, the, the language, uh, we divided gen to the all of the security problems, software gen problems, to the general buckets of the problem. And one of the most popular one is exactly general memory corruption bug and compare with the other languages. And so essentially Spark, as we mentioned, is a memory safe language, so none of this kind of problem exists. There is some kind of caveats which I don't want to focus now. However, you can think about that it's it's a memory safe language so memory corruption doesn't exist there. And um, then we move to the general pointer security and it's interesting because Spark doesn't have pointers at all. So if it doesn't have pointers the pointer security doesn't apply there. However, there is still kind of corner case like imagine we are able to generate the stacks exhaustion. So that's why uncontrolled memory allocation kind of semi exists if you don't run GNAT stack. But it can be, of course, catched by the toolset if you run them correctly. And also, there could be some kind of double factors. Imagine you DMA twice the same region of the memory. It's kind of possible to have like that. And then we move to the arithmetic security. And as I mentioned, the Spark gives you ability to have very precise type, uh, <laughs> type language. Essentially, you can define own type in the language and also define own boundaries. And then the prover will tell you if anyone crossed these boundaries which should be defined. So essentially because of that, you don't even need to use the general types like integers. You just define own one every time when you model uh, in your program with the hardware. Essentially, 
that's why none of this problem exists, like integer overflow and underflow or arithmetic overflow doesn't exist in the, uh, in the Spark. And then we also have other types of the problems, like missing default case in switch statement or assigning instead of comparing, and these problems doesn't exist in Spark because tools easily catch them. And then we're starting to find out something more interesting, like a parallel execution. Essentially, what about the problems like race condition or deadlocks? Essentially, it's possible to have them, but uh, I, I the core working on the extension to Spark course Ravenscar, which is supposed to close that gap. But from our perspective, it was not very interesting because the boot software was not running essentially uh, parallel. It was single execution, so it was not very interesting for us, but it's worth to mention. And then in the end, we move to the logical bugs. So essentially in the logical bugs, the prover and neither uh, 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 stack, none of the tools were can catch if you badly design the software because you try to model the hardware and you try to uh, generate uh, any kind of uh, software which runs on that specific states which you model and then in the end if you badly do that of course Spark won't be able to catch that you something badly designed or badly modeled because this is intention of your software so this kind of problem still exists if you accurately modeling the hardware or if you accurately handling the DMA or badly design the software so this is exactly the, the part which Spark cannot help you much so what did we learn from this evaluation? So essentially, as we mentioned before, you can still compile the buggy code uh, and because the problem are detected by the tools and developers just might not run them. And again, the tools are orthogonal, so they detect different classes of the problem. So again, to be fully protected, you must run all of the tools, not just uh, one of them. And from analysis of the uh, implementation bugs, we realize that there still might be security issue when you in the design problems or also some kind of logical errors but there is no kind of memory safety, for example. So it's not worth to focus on that. And again, there is additional class of the problem that could be introduced by the compiler, because bugs can be introduced by the compiler itself, even if it's not in the software or neither in the hardware. However, to be able to catch these three types of the problems, we need to analyze the binary, yes? So because we need to analyze the binary, we need to have any tools who can uh, target the risk V. And that was the problem that during this research, neither either Pro nor Ghidra native supported risk v there was some kind of plugins but there were no essentially uh, native support of risk v so we decided to focus on the Ghidra and add own uh, custom uh, plugin uh, to the Ghidra to be able to analyze the binary which was running there but was generated from spark language and this is what we end up doing and how did we do it so Ghidra 9.0 at that time this is what was the newest one didn't support natively RISC-V. Moreover, we, we were dealing with the custom RISC-V chips, not the standard RISC-V chip. So even if we had them, it will not work for us. So again, RISC-V is huge and implementa implementation of entire RISC-V base would take us a tons of time. And additionally, uh, we needed to add the custom uh, feature there, a custom extension, not just RISC-V base. So uh, what we end up doing, we found in the, in, on the GitHub a few RISC-V base plugins for Gitra, which had different implementation of, 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 of RISC-V, and we decided to integrate one of the plugins, which we thought it's a good one, on the top of tree of Gitra itself. And a few months after, which is what is interesting, Gitra 9.2 brought the natively RISC-V support and they use exactly the same plugin which we use uh, in our research. And uh, where to start? So essentially we successfully integrate RISC-V plugin first, but of course we need to modify it because we have custom extensions. So Gitra is using Slate language to describe the CPU and what is Slate language. And Slate language is a processor specification language developed just for Gitra and it heritage from the SLED. And uh, what is uh, not cool that there was at that time at least very little documentation about that. So if you want to implement some kind of a simple CPU, you can use uh, as a source of knowledge already implemented CPUs in the source code and based on that you can just implement own one. But if you want to do something more complex, uh, this could be a very painful and it was very painful at least for me. So uh, additionally, we found in fact only one interesting source of knowledge. It was a presentation made by Giuliani Valadon, uh, which we'll link here on the slide. So what do you need to do to implement CPU in the Ghidra? Essentially, you need to create a couple of files which are listed here. 
and uh, then we also define the model manifest how to tie them together and compile. However, we already had this file because we have uh, from the plugin, this based plugin, but we, we needed to modify them, especially slash spec, to be able to add custom extension. And this is exactly the file where you define the register definition, the tokens, the aliases, the instruction, etc. And Gitra, uh, what is interesting and it's worth to keep in mind, allows you to compile the bad uh, model slash spec as soon as the syntax is correct, as long as the syntax is correct, which essentially you will not even know if you make a mistake. Then you run the Gitra, you think everything works, then you meet the instruction which you badly implement on the runtime, and then you see tons of Java exception and maybe the program will crash. Uh, so we use essentially check and strike and calm down techniques to be able to achieve what we wanted. However, <clears throat> let's briefly talk about how to do this kind of custom extension or tokens or Gitra plugin CPU implementation. So essentially at first you define the token and the token of the instruction here defines how many bits instruction has you and you can define them in the range of the bits which you are focused with the, from the various aliases of the name. Here on the bottom you have for example the name CSR0 which will be representing the bits <coughs> from 20 to 27 <coughs> as a token. And then you also can define the register and RISGV, for example, have status registers like use status from the user mount status, which you define the register, the offset, the size and the name. And then you can glue them together so you can attach the variables to the CSR0, you can attach the, the names of the register, which you defined before. And this is exactly what you do. We just exactly also what we did. We just defined the custom extension, the custom um, uh, tokens, the custom register, the custom variables, and then we're starting to define the custom instruction and how to define the instruction. So this is example of the compressed add instruction. You essentially define what are the operands. There's two operands here, D and CSR. CRS2 and then you define what are the values of the tokens which you define <coughs> as previously uh, and as uh, which bits they are mapping and then you define what they must be necessary values for them to be able to decode this specific instruction so example the COP0001 token with the value 2 and the bits between 13 to 15 um, interpreted as a token COP1315 must have value 4 etc etc you define all of the bits and then the Gitra will know that this is exactly the instruction <coughs> which you are looking for and then you define the pseudo the code. If it matches, you go to the pseudo code in the compressed in add, add instruction, you essentially add two operands. So that's what we did. And then uh, there is another example of the compress uh, branch equal zero. It's exactly the same. You define the tokens, you define the values of the tokens which are necessary to uh, encode the instruction, you define the operands, and then if in the pseudo code you check if the operands is zero, then you just jump. Uh, and that's all. And in the end, when we're starting to add that and we add the custom extension on the top of the RISC-V base ISA uh, uh, on this plugin which we had, we end up having this, which is very cool. So essentially, what this is a screenshot from the Gitra that shows you that essentially it correctly decompile the program and uh, uh, you, you have forfeited the compiler on the right side, if you see. On the left side, you have the assembly and on the right side, we uh, starting to have for free the, the compiler. And as you can see, this is a binary which was generated from the Spark. Uh, this is a symbol name which they found, like Ada, RV from RISC-V, etc. However, that's the idea that we also got for free, not only the disassembly, but also an analyzer. We also had the custom extension was uh, automatically reflected in the decompiler, which of course obviously make our life much easier. So, Gluing everything together, we already know what to look for because we analyze the Spark. We know what the limits for the language and what we can hunt from from the offensive perspective. Obviously, not memory safety issues. However, we also know that we were running on the Risk V, and it was not normal Risk V, but the custom Risk V chip. So we focus on the design on how hardware is more focused. So we focus on what is the design uh, on this, of the Spark, software Spark, how is it designed uh, and how to implement the custom hardware, how is it modeled, because this we know what is there and it's not standard. So what we saw, we saw uh, under and um, um, during analyzing the binary, because that's why we needed to have this Gitra plugin, that very first, very, very first instruction um, of this boot software was configuring the hardware, also custom hardware. And not only, but additional also custom hardware. As soon as the first instruction run is starting to configure the hardware, and uh, later we see that uh, instructions of uh, setting up the MTVEC value. 
And then we're starting to iterate what is MTVEC value, and officially this GUI documentation says that MTVEC is defined as a register read only and or read write, which holds the base address of the trap handler. And by default, RISGV always handles all of the traps in the most privileged mode, which is M mode, so it can delegate this uh, trap to the least the other modes, modes if it's needed to. And when the essentially trap happens, the RISGV switches to the machine mode and sets the instruction pointer counter um, the, to that to the value defined in the register MTVEC. And MTVEC can be defined in the two modes. There is a mode which essentially keeps the direct pointer, which is just jump there, and is defined by the two least significant bits. So bit zero and one, if it's zero, then we have direct mode, you just jump to the pointer. Or if it's non-zero, then it's being treated the value there as a vector vectorized, like IDT table on x86, for example. So then we're starting to think that MTVEC is essentially configured after we configure the hardware. So what will happen if any interrupt arrives before the MTVEC is initialized? Because it can happen during initialization of the hardware. And this is exactly what we discovered that essentially there is a problem because RISGV MTVEC register specification does not define the initial value of uh, MTVEC at all. So it's undefined. However, when we're starting to analyze a few different implementations of RISGV, we found out that most of the test and implementation set it to zero anyway. But in many implementations, zero is not a valid address, or if it's valid, it's not mapped. And then the reference to it, to MTVEC pointer, which is null, will generate an exception. And this is kind of interesting, because if there is any exception generated before initialized MTVEC register, RISGV ends up in the very stable infinitive exception mode, because it's starting to the reference a null pointer, which is not valid, and generate another exception, which generates another exception, and so on, so on. And what was interesting, that uh, during this experiment, RISGV did not halt. It was not halted, it's continued spinning in the infinitive exception loop. And such state in is in fact ideal situation for default injection attack, like glitching attack, because RISGV at first is running in the highest privilege mode, which is M mode, and constantly referencing the glitchable register. And uh, this is the first bug, essentially, which we found, that ISA does not define the initial value of MTVEC register. And the second bug is that ISA allows you to have infinitive exception loop without halting the core. There is lack of double or triple fault like exception, uh, which is kind of interesting. And however, how to exploit this kind of issues which we found? And this is where I would like to hand over to Alex Motrosov, which physically glitched the RISGV and he can take you over from there. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Hello, DevCon. My name is Alex Matrosov, and I will be walking you over our exploitation technique for MTVAC. And it's actually two important points just Adam mentioned it on the previous slide. We have MTVAC undefined behavior, and the core of RISC-V also doesn't halt it, and it is actually uh, looped after um, such of the exception happening with uh, undefined behavior of MTVAC instruction. But let's talk about the attack scenario. And it is important points which you need to know before we basically get an actual scenario. We need to prefill the IMM of RISC-V core. Um, and we can use like external uh, recover USB boot flow functionality or access over UART. So, and second thing, we need an ability to generate an early exception during core execution. Basically, it is a physical hardware damage can cause that. And let's go to the scenario. Let's say we prefilled IMM with our as a shell code, but it is some interesting techniques we used to make it uh, the attack more stable. Because when uh, after successful MTVAC exceptions, uh, exception, uh, when we jumping into IMM, it can be some random address, right? And we need to make sure our code will be executed uh, with, actu with actual payload. So we need to prefill IMM with an OPS and an OPS LED will be basically creating some sort of insurance will be get into the random place, but it will be led our shellcode execution. And on top of our NOPS LED, we put actual shellcode with a payload and it will be basically uh, the realistic attack scenario in our case. So attacker boot risk five core 
and then enforce the necessary condition to generate an early exception during the boot, uh, software boot and uh, uh, execute uh, before actually MTV get initialized, right? So a risk wife core will be jump into the null page and enters to the state of the infinite loop exception. Very stable and predictable state, by the way, and it's actually one of the conditions of our success in uh, this attack scenario. Attacker uh, glitches uh, the MTV register uh, CSR, and uh, the, after the value get uh, glitched, because it's just a boolean uh, value, uh, even one bit change will be change the condition of this register, right? And the looped core will be point somewhere into IMAM uh, and the special payload, which we discussed before, will be executed uh, with our shell code. So it's very interesting and stable attack scenario. We tested in many uh, different ways and I will be explaining how we actually uh, created the fault injection attack in the next slide. But before we move there, uh, two, uh, one, um, thing you need to remember, because MTV register has a null page, it's very likely that the change of one bit will be end up and generating address pointing in the middle of the knob slap in IMAM. And it's exactly why we need the fault injection attack. And we experimented with a different type of fault injection attacks, clock glitching, uh, um, voltage glitching and uh, actually we try to chip shooter and with an obsolete it's actually possible um, but uh, most stable and in our case because we experiment with uh, UFO boards and chip whisper and it is UFO board with a risk 5 silicon CPU on it so uh, we actually able uh, to reach very stable point with a clock glitching attack so on this uh, oscilloscope diagram, you exactly see that the glitch happens uh, with the clock technique. But also because uh, we uh, measure uh, these values uh, with the clock glitching, even with this small guy, Chip Whisperer Nano, we can manage after we await all the parameters and we have the offsets of the time frames, uh, we can create successful attack uh, and actually uh, with much cheaper hardware. So, of course, uh, we tried this complex scenario in many different environments. And uh, first of all, thanks for uh, NVIDIA hardware team, which is actually uh, help us a lot to uh, play with the simulation environment, with internal hardware. And uh, actually, first of all, we realized about this attack uh, when we've been playing with some internal tools. Uh, on this slide, you can see uh, uh, the simulation environment where we have a uh, following scenario. Uh, on, the first, on step first, we pull the trigger to corrupt MTVAC register CSR, uh, uh, the value of CSR, and um, loop in the core. And on the wave uh, diagram, it's very feasible when that happens. And the step two actually uh, leading the value change and then equal triggers an exception candler with a corrupted MTV register value. And that's lead exactly uh, pointing um, to IMAM uh, and uh, executing our knob slot and lead the shellcode execution. But let's talk also about how uh, we report this bug and how we fix this uh, bug with an industry effort from the RISC-V Foundation community. Actually, it was a very tough scenario uh, because think about, you find the bug, not in actual implementation, not in a single board, you find the bug in ISA, that means most of the boards which is currently available in the markets, it's affected by, th by this issue. And uh, um, how to fix it, right? So first of all, like, of course, when we just realize this a big issue, we contact the risk five foundation. And until the time it was no official security response group. And uh, it's been actually 
Uh, we work with uh, RISC-V Foundation over our PCRT, and also now it is official security response group exists, which is good, right? And I think they can address uh, security bugs and issues with ISA and not only the ISA tied to the RISC-V Foundation uh, as an industry call much more efficient. Also, we contact Sci-Fi and uh, working with them on uh, analyzing this issue and actually we allocated the CV number uh, 2021-1104 and uh, NVIDIA PCRT and uh, NVIDIA RISC-V hardware team uh, confirmed this issue and fixed this issue internally and sync with all involved parties for responsible disclosure. It's been uh, kind of tough and timeline been also uh, very limited because we want to deliver this talk on Def DEFCON conference, but all the parties need to be secure first of all, right? And um, how actually we can uh, propose the fix for these problems, right? So first of all, what we need to do with initialized MTVAC. All tested chips uh, have MTVAC programmable and the most common mode vulnerable to this hybrid problem. And um, actually, we also realized some of the newer chip being released recently this uh, uh, spring also actually affected by this problem because of course nobody thinks before about MTVAC and the finite behavior. But of course, without uh, loop at core, uh, uh, on the exception handler, this attack will be not exploitable. And if uh, MTVEC value uh, will be not described and then still undefined behavior exists, but let's say it will be some double or triple fault like exception or like just in the help, this will be prevent the code execution which we described on the previous slide. So, but how we can fix this issue and what kind of mitigations it can be? First of all, it can be a combination of uh, hardware mitigations and software mitigations. But let's talk uh, about uh, DCLS. And DCLS and TCLS, it's actually very interesting techniques when we uh, take in uh, the shadow core uh, DCLS with a double core or TCLS with a triple core uh, for, in consideration of additional uh, execution uh, following the instruction flow, right? So the shadow core is just uh, ha having the same flow, the same instruction at in sync with the uh, original core. And if instruction flow is not equal, it will be panic or halted or whatever happens as defined in the silicon, right? Same thing happening with uh, TCLS, uh, and TCLS just introduce uh, two cores, and it will be much uh, diffi more difficult to um, to glitch. And uh, in case of the two cores, uh, the possibility of the glitch still possible potentially, but of course it's raising and increasing the bar. TCLS created much even much harder uh, the attack scenario. And uh, I would say realistically, it's need, first of all, to be uh, involved in multiple glitch attacks in simultaneously. So you need to glitch simultaneously multiple cores. And with the corruption of the instruction, let's say you need to corrupt uh, the value. And if these values are different, so it can be cause some additional exceptions which you can't predict, right? So I would say uh, it's raising the bar. Of course, the attack still possible, but much more complicated. And, but let's talk about the software mitigations. And uh, Jeremy Boone uh, from NCC Group recently uh, created a blog series about the software mitigations. And thank you for that. It was a great uh, uh, series of explanation from the industry standards about software mitigations. But of course, all these mitigations known for a while and uh, um, also it's broadly used. Software mitigations doesn't prevent such of the attacks, but it's raising the bar in many cases. It's much make much more difficult um, the attack scenario or like uh, uh, for uh, unexperienced attacker, it's make it even impossible. But uh, all this uh, hemming distance, clear memory, random delays and redundant checks, it's actually can be introduced on the compiler level and created automatically because 
Uh, first of all, uh, the developer can forget to install these mitigations or like uh, copy paste something incorrectly or forget to change before uh, copying this uh, sort of mitigations in uh, different places. Also, some of them just can be uh, utilized by compiler during the compilation flows because redundant checks, as example, without special uh, definitions or compiler extensions, it will be optimized uh, during the compilation phases. And you clearly can see this in disassembly flow. Also, uh, we propose some decisions, uh, uh, we propose some design decisions to address for empty VEC weaknesses. And basically, as we said before, uh, start CPU need to signal uh, when the signal will be arrives, pre-initialize empty VEC to point to the halt instruction. Basically, if something happens, it will be initiate the halt and uh, change the ISA uh, needed because we need to warn about the potential undefined behavior if the empty VEC will be uh, not initialized, right? And uh, we need to basically introduce this kind of comment into the ISA documentation. Also, uh, introduction of double, triple fault-like exception will be complementary to the halt of the core. And actually, instead of infinite loop, it will be make uh, this uh, attack vector unexploitable. It will be cause the denial of service, but the not code execution we described previously. And of course, like it's much more uh, can be explained in terms of uh, risk five hardening. And I think uh, uh, the mitigations against software attacks can be explained in different ways, but also it is brilliant research being done of introducing uh, pointer masking and uh, uh, Adam will be take over from that place. Thanks, Alex. Let's briefly talk about the pointer masking extension for RISC-V, which can significantly increase the security state of entire RISC-V ecosystem in the software, especially in the software, but also in the hardware, and can also reduce the impact or at least increase the, the bar of exploitability of this MTVEC issue, which we're speaking about here today. So this extension is driven uh, as a collaboration between NVIDIA, Google, RISC-V T extension, and the J extension task group. So this is a huge collaboration. And from the security perspective, it allows to implement uh, various technologies, including hardware ASAN, including pointer authentication code, known as PAC, hardware memory sandboxing, and uh, it also can serve as a foundation for other extensions, including hardware memory tagging, which cannot exist in the RISC-V without the pointer masking, and also it can significantly improve the security um, of the other extension, which is uh, uh, protected, it can protect the uh, control flow integrity attributes and shadow stack which is an extension driven by the T task group and the work is in progress uh, however these kind of technologies are mostly known excluding the one which is hardware memory sandboxing this is kind of innovative and uh, we haven't seen in other architectures so what is uh, hardware memory sandboxing? Essentially, it allows you to lock down the specific execution context on the subregion of the memory. So even you can make an extra boundary between the threads, even if they run on the same uh, process context. So the thread execution, executed thread might not even be able physically to see or reference any memory outside of the pre-configured one. And uh, this is uh, being enforced in the hardware level. Uh, but this is more than that. Because essentially what you can think about that, that essentially you can lock down what is specific ranges of the memory, which are visible for each specific execution context. So even if you have the vulnerability in such kind of software, which runs um, uh, on specific execution context, such vulnerability will not allow you to jump over the predefined memory region. So even if some kind of secrets it's, li it's living in the other pages, which normally this specific uh, software doesn't need to have access to, uh, the vulnerability in the classic way will allow you to steal these secrets or override these secrets. But because pointer masking can lock down what do you physically see, which physical pages and also virtual pages, um, then you can uh, 
protect that such kind of vulnerability will not be able to allow attacker using the current execution context to reference or, or corrupt any kind of the secrets outside of their predefined memory regions. And this is exactly what the hardware memory sandboxing um, uh, is doing and uh, is provided by the pointer masking isolation feature. And essentially it's slightly even more than that because you can have multiple different execution contexts which are logged down and they never be able uh, never be able to reference memory which does not belong or are not configured for them to be seen and this also allows you to implement um, uh, features like uh, not only sandboxing but also uh, to for the low cost devices you do not need to do full uh, context switching because essentially the execution context is cannot corrupt their metadata between themselves because they're kind of locked down, you might not do a full context switch which you can save you uh, performance. So this is what essentially does it do. And from the MTVEC perspective, what can, uh, what the, how the pointer masking can, can um, help, essentially you can predefine the specific boot software can only be able to reference the memory for a very small specific subregion of the memory. So then if you want to glitch the MTVEC register, a random corruption of the random bit will most likely do not allow you to execute your custom code or shellcode because you will not even see that. You will be locked down in specific execution context, which will be very hard to predict what type of bit you need to precisely glitch to be able to end up in the predefined memory sandbox. So that's what it is. And uh, I would like to hand over to Alex. Thanks, Adam. And I will be finish our presentation. And uh, actually, uh, first of all, I want to address some acknowledgements for NVIDIA team and there's been a lot of people involved from GPU system software and our RISC-V hardware team. I want to thank you also product security uh, and especially our PCR team where uh, they've been hardly working on this issue because in the beginning it's been not obvious where this issue need to be reported and actually which parties we need to discuss this issue. We need also to thank you Sci5 and RISC 5 Foundation because RISC 5 Foundation take our concerns very serious and address uh, this issue to whole ecosystem and also security team got created. Also Sci5 uh, been very pleasant during the disclosure process and help us uh, to uh, understand this issue and side effects more deeply. In the summary, uh, I want to actually summarize our research and first part we also cover some type safety languages and formal verification um, with the IDA core and Spark. Of course it is minimized some attack surfaces with the memory corruption issues but it is not a silver bullet and some issues can be still exist and especially it's hard to mitigate some uh, undefined behavior or uh, race condition attacks and of course uh, in the end, the code compiles to the native code, right? And to machine code by the compiler and formal verification happens on early stage before this transition to intermediate representation happens and all the compiler optimization applies. It's still some room for undefined behavior and a lot of other interesting things can happen. Um, there are CPU ISA bugs exist, right? So, and we found two uh, interesting side effects in uh, RISC V uh, ISA, and this actually uh, real world attack scenarios can combine with a physical uh, attack such as the fault injection, and in combination with software exploitation uh, techniques, it can lead to very uh, realistic and impactful attack scenarios. And of course, disclosing the ISA box it's tough, and we need to basically uh, pay more attention on our open ISA and basically how these bugs can be addressed and what kind of way and path to reporting it will be exist for the researcher, right? Thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll be happy to answer the questions.